right. Well, uh, God be with you all. And um, also with you. Uh, today, God be with this group as we listen and learn to listen and learn to respond um, through the example of uh, our history and uh, those who have led us in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And so we're going to try to get through two chapters, uh, three different people, two chapters. I love, I um, wonder how you all feel about that. I love the title of uh, chapter 10 called <laughs> Forwarding. You know, <laughs> and we don't use it much anymore because we have cell phones and we don't have to worry about it. But I remember when call forwarding was just begun and that fascinating way you could I mean, enter those numbers into your phone and it would follow you wherever you were, you know, uh -huh. like I, could not, I wouldn't have to be in the office. The office would ring on my home phone. Um, this idea of call forwarding. Um, some people get confused about Elijah and Elijah. I don't know whether God did that on purpose just to keep us on our toes. Um, and I, and as I look around this table and this screen, I, I know for certain that, that, uh, this idea that we must carry it all, that we must carry it all is something that we've all encountered. This idea that if I don't do this, it won't happen. It will oh, fail. Cool. The world will come to an end. There will be no Christmas. I, I, it doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever the circumstance is, there, the birthday parties will never be the same if I don't do it. This organization, these women will never meet in the same, whatever it is, whatever, whatever it is that we've been in charge of or had some part in organizing where we felt that if we stepped away, that it would not function. You know, and, and, and I think that all comes from a good place. And yet, doesn't it get kind of all, it's messy then, because we, we become the center of the activity, the universe, as opposed to God being the center of that and trusting that God will find someone else to lead, to do, to be, to organize. Uh, so here's my story. And then, you know, he had his story about looking at Atlas and Atlas carrying the <laughs> world uh, for years. You know, I'm the oldest in my family. And so for years, I organized all the holiday things where we'd be, who would do what, who would bring what, what time it would start, when it would end. I would decorate it. I would do it. When I went to go to seminary, um, I said to my sister, I can no longer do it. And uh, so I handed it over to her. And you know what? It's been fine. It's been better than fine. And uh, it all still happened. That's my, you know, and although there was some dissatisfaction because my brother said, well, how come you didn't call and tell us? <laughs> I don't know that it was Christmas. It's on the calendar. I, I really don't know, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but you and I can see by your faces that you've all and I would love to hear your if you've been able to and what the result what was the result as as amazing as Elisha taking up and hit, you know this is where we get that word when we say take up the mantle right when you've heard that expression it comes from this text because he did indeed take up the mantle of, and, and we'll use the mantle, right? They rolled it up, turned it into a staff, hit the water, did all the things that, you know, happen when God's in the room, things we could never imagine uh, on our own. So take, given, given, given away the mantle, take it, you know, as, can, can you all talk about that? Any, any personal experience you might have with that? Well, in Birmingham, Michigan, um, they had a <laughs> girls softball league. This is for little girls in school grades. Um, doesn't matter. Second through sixth or something like that. Okay. Sort of they did. Um, it was run by daddies who thought they knew, excuse me, because they're wonderful daddies that thought they knew softball. <laughs> and then the girls that came to town. And so then I took it over as soon as um, 
my youngest was in high school. And they called me the sheriff. And men, <laughs> men were disgruntled. Who is this broad that thinks she knows about this game? And, and all of a sudden, I mean, I am doing all this stuff. And I had the girls from Bowling Green come up and did clinics for the daddy so they would really know how to play. And all of a sudden, we've got... We're sending out applications to a thousand little girls who before had no idea, had all these teams going and all this stuff. And uh, it was wonderful. And then I, about, I did that for 10 years. And then I said, I think we're, my husband wants to retire and go somewhere else. <laughs> but, and I was so afraid this whole thing was just, oh my God. Now all the daddies will get back together and have neighborhood teams where people's feelings are hurt and all that kind of stuff. So I said, okay, this is my last year. It was amazing. These two really good dads stepped up and said, we're going to keep doing this just the way Kate does. We're going to have the drafts and we're going to have, and will the girl, can you get us somebody? Can you leave this in place? Sure. And they went on as if I'd never, ever <laughs> stepped out of the room. I was like, how'd that happen? I kept waiting for phone, I kept waiting for phone calls, you know. Kate, now how did you do this? But they didn't ask. They just. So the question is, don't ever, I mean, always uh, be careful what you ask. You wanted to leave, but you didn't want to, you, you wanted them to still appreciate you. So, well, they, so you they had a big party. They had a big party and they oh. gave me all this stuff. But yes, I mean, it was just weird to, to give it up for one thing or another. To see him. It was function. your baby. It was my baby. And you birthed it. Well. I <laughs> did. Sheriff and all. <clears throat> but you realize that somebody can do what you were doing if you let them. <laughs> yes. And in, and may do it better. I mean. I didn't go so You close. didn't go that far. <laughs> Well, I can. Yes. I just gave up to be okay. Yes. And our last, our first meeting with the new people, it was fabulous. Judy Gray is so creative, and she has little games that make it fun. So it's better than it ever was. So, yeah, but it was hard to give it up because they loved it. Just loved it. And it was very meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but. It would be better then. So that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's, it's different. It's I think, you know, God, God has a different direction, maybe a different thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of how, what, that's that letting go piece of it. Uh, that is the hardest one. Thank you for that. It's humbling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's humbling when you think. I'm not, I'm not talking about anybody individually, but it's humbling to go, what? I can be. What? Replace? Wait a minute. You know, I mean, it is. It's humbling. And, you know, I, I really haven't had that. I'm a very, <laughs> very low-level person. Okay. In fact, when the, when the director of special ed came to me in Brevard and said, you're going to be the preschool disabilities coordinator, I was like, oh, no, you hired me to be, you know, you know. And I was just like, whatever, you know. Uh, so I am not a person that jumps up to you know uh, leadership but you know it, it is humbling when you realize you can be uh, replaced uh, and yet there's some people that are around that I think dear Lord please don't ever let them stop doing what they're doing well they don't have to but but they're, they're, that's right, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and then how does anybody else I mean I think the other thought. part of that is you know <laughs> Then how does anyone else get a chance to exactly. to to, to, exactly. to do leadership? Yeah, exactly. if we are continually, I mean, and I get that, and you know, churches are probably the best example of it. Well, I don't know, I don't do anything else, so <laughs> I, don't, I only I am only have like examples of family stuff or church. That's it. But churches are kind of notorious for this. Someone's doing it; they're doing a good job. Why would we change it? Why would we muck that up? They know where the silverware is. I don't want to change that. I don't want to tell somebody how everything works. On the other hand, I've been blessed to be in transition of ministry where someone thought, well, I, you know, this, this ministry will go, can't go on or whatever happens. And 
you know, it shows us that we're not irreplaceable. We're not. I mean, these are the, the examples that he gives. First, we're not alone. This is our major foible as human beings. If it doesn't go on, it, it doesn't speak very highly to what you've done while you were there. So there's nothing to toot your horn about. That's right. But that's well, you kind might of, have done well, but you didn't prepare for succession. So that's, well, that's you know, got to be part of it. Yeah. And my way of, of handling that all my life <clears throat> until the barn, um, <laughs> frankly, uh, has been that I've closed, I've closed that door tightly behind me and, and didn't walk back, you know, the school. I, I've not been back on that property um, since I sold that school, not e except for when they named the admin building after me and I went, that's it. Um, and it's been that way with everything. I don't have a single friend from all three colleges and college degrees that I'm in touch with. Huh. Um, it, on it's purpose? So, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think I found out early on that, you know, it's, I remember thinking after a lecture one time as I was walking out, and this, I mean, talk about knowing that your ego has gone too far, is that I had so knocked it out of the ballpark with my speech. These two women were, were waiting. I could see to talk to me as I was leaving, and I walked right by them. And, and this is embarrassing. Imagine them saying, who was that masked stranger? <laughs> I'm sorry. And I realize this is not, don't revisit, don't revisit. But the church is my life. And I, you know, so I, I will admit to some struggles of doing that with the barn mm -hmm. um, because I'm not going anywhere and I can't, my only way to go anywhere is if I don't come to this church and I'll never stop doing that. But I, you know, that is absolutely the way it's been handled. I ran a tennis program with, 21 centers when I was uh, just finished college, quit that, never looked back. I don't even think I ever played tennis again. Oh I mean, it really is bizarre. It's, it's crazy. So don't go anywhere, you guys. So the, <laughs> if, if, as so, long as your example, you won't. Okay. So sabbatical, Bob's sabbatical right now fits in this conversation. You know, one of the many benefits of it, I think, is to give that Separate. space. Uh, yes. And not just him, but us too. Yeah, you know? exactly. Well, that's what we've, we've been hoping for, for sure. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. 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 It's there. And I, I think that's a, the, one of the beauties of, of this text and, and then our own thinking around that. And I think everybody would have an example of something somebody asked you to do or called you to do or you felt compelled to do that you would not have thought you could have managed. You would not have thought you'd had the skills to, to do or that it's something you hadn't done before. I remember having a conversation with you, Laura, a year ago about, you know, the senior warden job, maybe a little bit less than a year ago. But, but yeah, but could you do that? And that wasn't something you'd done. And could, you know, what, how would that look? And it would look the way you and God have it to look. You know, whatever thing we do, I, I don't think Elijah looked exactly like Elijah. Like that wasn't, he, there was a job to do. The, the kingdom of, was in a disarray. Um, it was messy. And, uh, you know, you think that their only wings of communication was like traveling to the place or maybe sending maybe some sort of written communication, but I doubt it. And so, you know, how you, and then I guess the, go, you know, think about court gossip. Think about England this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard any of that. But, um, but just, just think of that, you know, I, confronting that, being a voice who's continually saying, remember, y'all, this is the way God's called us to go. And they're saying, no, we, we think we should start, you know, making sacrifices to Baal. <laughs> this is really working well for our Canaanite brothers and sisters. And we think that if we start doing this, Water, will, you know, the, the, the famine will be over, the drought will cease, the crops will increase their yield, whatever it is that they were facing or that their leaders would behave in a particular way that would ensure the safety and livelihood of the people, right? But so in any case, I don't, 
I can see Elijah, first of all, you know, Elijah's depressed, Elisha, Elijah's per, per de depression over knowing that the, his time as a prophet was coming to an end and that he was not really making any headway at all. It was very frustrating. And then Elijah's reluctance to accept this would, would kind of, you know, it's just this kind of like stardom. This guy like won, you know, I don't know what it would be, America's top idol. He's, he kind of won the, he's won the, he was one that he was, famous Elvis. yes he was the elvis i loved that movie by the way have anybody seen that it's an amazing yeah. moment tom hanks i would just recommend that movie it's just it's going to be at the uh, oh, really? i saw it on the airplane it's really good i, mm -hmm. I was not expecting it. i'm not an elvis fan i mean not not an elvis mm -hmm. fan but not I bet you're tom hanks. not me not generally but and uh boy does he do a good job playing a villain does a really good job playing a villain Anyway, that was not the point. Okay, sorry. I never have been able to keep Elijah and Elijah. <laughs> well, you, right. we, we hopefully we'll, we'll figure that out. So I went up with a chair. That was, yeah, that was yeah. it. Well, that One of them has got a cup on the Passover thing. <laughs> that's Elijah, right? J-A-H. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that guy. And then, the, and yes, and so went up in a chariot of fire. Us, the only other person we know of to have ascended into heaven, Man. other than Mary and Jesus, <laughs> that we talk about and then uh you know it has a cup set for him at every seder meal That's right. yeah. <laughs> this elisha doesn't get that didn't get that billing but did carry on did indeed carry on uh, this idea that we are duplicatable and maybe that goes to your point um irv about sabbatical i don't i'm not trying to be rob yeah. But I can do Rob's tasks. And, and we're all when we're in a situation like when we succeed somebody in leadership or whatever. We all do it our way. Not, and that's part of the need. And groups, organizations need different things at different times. Too. Yeah. I, just, I also just love that somebody can take it to the next level. That, and that was... It's definitely been true of the school. It was true of the tennis program. It's, it's been true where I've taught. I mean, that, I don't know if it, it almost feels like a ministry of um, be the seed planter. <laughs> and, and sometimes I've grumbled about, but wait, I, I really would like to be part of the harvest. Um, no, maybe that's not what it's supposed to be. I worked for someone once who said he claimed his place had been in, in um, coming in where there had been conflict, you know, like after conflict. And, and I thought, well, oh, you know, that sounds like a horrible job. <laughs> who wants that work? But, um, but I think some people are more, you know, in tune to do what? Build up relationships in a place or do the healing work or walk uh, through an, uh, a vision <coughs> process or, you know, like that, those are, we know that the different people come at different times. And sometimes there's the rare person who can serve, say a congregation for 30 plus years and do all of that, Bless you. you know, handle all of that work. Um, which, which is an amazing thing when that can happen. A lot of time people are for a season, you know, you've seen that on boards and so on. And sometimes they can, they can, uh, there's a different kind of call that invites others in, which is I think what happens when someone's there for a longer period of time. It may not be that, that, that they have all those gifts, but it may be that they, they are able to recognize those gifts in others and invite them in for their season of service. That's what right. term limits are about. Right. You know, to try to, but, uh, but you know, and I, and I hope we can be a place that creates that kind of space to hear God's call to honor the objections, the, um, the insecurity that often comes with that, the, the wandering a bit about it, wandering and wondering that comes with that, you know, so people can't have the space to sort of say, well, I can't do it the way, I'll just take DOK, right? I can't do it the way Lawson did it, but I can do the way I do it, right? That's the, 
that's the thing. That's what Laura said. I can't do it the way someone else was senior warden, but I can do it the way I'm senior warden. Um, so we, we do that, you know, we, we do that. We look for that in others. And sometimes it's forced on us by health or circumstance or a, a, a real need or a move or a whatever, you know, it's forced on us or we see it that way. Sometimes if we can allow that to sort of, doesn't mean there's not going to be grief or anger or frustration or disappointment or all the other emotions that accompany all kinds of changes in leadership. Those, of course, will be there. But I think underneath all that, you know, if we can, when we can see God at work. Now, I think I've also been parts of some organizations where I saw some changes in leadership that I did not think God was at work in. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how to discern that. I know. I, I mean, I know how to. I know how. To, oh, thanks. I know how to see it. I recognize it, perhaps more in hindsight, right? But how do we speak to that? And um, without, without ever, well, like, <laughs> it sounds like I just wipe out churches. But the, <laughs> the one in Florida, when we started going to this one, you know, and we would, Joe and I said, "Well, how about this?" And I'm like, "Oh, we don't do it that way. We've never done it that way." We don't do it. I said, well, you're not doing too well. So maybe we better try something new. I mean, you know, people don't want to let go of some of those things too. And, and so it's, it's a battle um, to know if, if God is telling you keep pushing or to back off or to back off and yeah. leave alone. You know, maybe some of that's time. Maybe some of that's prayer. Sure. I hope it's those things. Uh, right. And sometimes some it's, of it's personalities. Sometimes yeah. Because they don't want anybody telling them, you know, that's how the, how it is. The status quo is this way. They're not open. It's hard to know, to discern what that is. Whether you should keep on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's part of, I'm taking this conversation. So Where are you going? <laughs> Where are you going, sister? Part of the ears to hear is having the ears to hear that maybe somebody else coming in and doing this is good. And to be accepting of that. And that's part of the deal. That it? is part of the deal. Yeah. Those are in his questions at the end, right? Okay. Um, I am the only one left, Elijah said. In what ways do you imagine yourself as indispensable? And does that impact the way you view your ministry? I think that leads us to resentment often. I, I mean, I, I know for myself, it leads me to resentment. Um, you guys have heard that story, you know, about the sweet potato casserole so i won't bore you with that one but what? it's it's about letting go of my minister of being in charge of every holiday in our family oh, yeah. and so um and then my sister-in-law and her inability to do what i wanted her to do and how that leads to resentment in some families it's kind of like the little red hen yeah yeah that's a great story right yeah. but then then not being very happy when somebody else takes over it, it helps because they're not in control anymore. Not that that was you. Oh, no, no, it's definitely but, me. But that little red hen always gets me. So I love the <laughs> yeah, who will help me grind the wheat? <laughs> and then Todd, that's what Todd used to say to me. Okay, little red hen. Oh, oh, oh I don't know what oh, that is. The story of the little red hen who's the only one who can grind the wheat and who will help her grind the wheat and then nobody. all the other nobody. farm animals everybody's busy they're all busy there. but then of course they want to eat the yeah. bread yes. oh, at the end good. yes go home and left look. out of my child yes you need to go look that one up it's in the same vein not in the same it's not the same uh moral it is a moral tale it's not the same moral tale as like um the sky is falling. <laughs> I know, I know. But if you share both of those traits, then it's a terrible, terrible it takes a lifetime to recover <laughs> from being both a little redhead and chicken little or whatever. Chicken little, I got. Yeah. I got that one down pat. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, if you consider, as he says here in this question, as you consider specific aspects of your call in the church, in your home, at work, what is your reaction to the possibility that the Lord may someday perhaps soon, his, his parentheses there, replace you. Does this bring joy or a sense of burden? Are, you, are there ministries God might be asking you to relinquish? This is very different than other ways we've been reading uh, up until this point. And um, 
we're a little bit more than two thirds of the way done. And now, now he's interjecting this idea that maybe it's not a call towards something, but maybe a call away from something. Mm -hmm. Or away from something to go towards something mm -hmm. else. Well, I, I mean, that, that's, you know, I, I suppose that's there, or it may be a time of uh, relaxation. It yes. may be a time of rest. It may be a time of renewal. It may be uh, a, a time of discernment. It may, you know, so we, yes, I, I suppose eventually we are called from one thing to another. I'm not sure they usually follow on the heels quite so, so rapidly. Now, yeah, yeah. if you feel a call to something, it may mean for health purposes, and I mean spiritual, emotional, physical health, that you have to let go of something else that you can't possibly hold all of that at the same time, which is hard for me to understand. I, I, I just want us to look too, though, at the, the importance of whatever foundation was built. I know a lot of people, um, especially as you were leaving loss and talked about the changes you made and, and the focus on prayer and healing um, that was new for us. And, See, all of that enables, okay, that work's done. And all of that enables Judy and, uh, and uh, um, Pam. Pam to take it to the next level then. And that, you know, so we're going the right direction. And everybody who's been on that path took us there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really just important to remember it is and uh but we but we, we but the the ability to sort of say my time is absolutely is hard. over i think that's the harder because point. if we can't if we can't do that then there can't be growth in that organization or that group of people mm -hmm. it's not just growth but sometimes sustainability uh-huh that's sometimes a word we different. yeah uh -huh. yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah because we can do things that are not sustainable. Yeah. Right. And I, there's in the church, that's a word we've used for like the last 15 years, right? Like, is this ministry sustainable or do we just keep relying on the same people to do the same things? Now we had a very, like last night we had a newcomer event. There were no newcomers here. Um, Y'all were the newest. A new, <laughs> the, the Duncans were a little bit newer than us. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but, but so, does that mean that that ministry in that f form shouldn't go on? I don't, I, that's not what I mean. But it does say, is that sustainable? Is that sustainable for that? Much? And I, I, everybody that was here had a great time. We all sat around one table. We talked. We had a glass of wine together. It was a very enjoyable way to spend an hour and a half. Very enjoyable. And Todd appreciates it because he doesn't get that kind of time to sure. really connect with people. So, you know, is it, it maybe not, there were not newcomers here in a sense, but in the sense that maybe we're all new to each other, maybe it was fulfilled. So I hold that when I think about when we do a program, when we, when we have a class, when we do this, this, whatever it is, you know, what does that mean to be sustainable in terms of uh, the energy of the people putting it on and, uh, what is its value? What does it do? What does it accomplish? Um, Lawson, I'm thinking again about the chosen and, you know, um, the number of folks that came or didn't come, the amount of work to have a meal. And, you know, but, but I think even I, who at the end of a work day, you know, and, and part of why I was there was obligation, you know, and, and responsibility and so forth. But I cannot, I cannot separate now the value that I received from that, you know, how yeah, God was working. Big success. Yes. How God was working in that. Right. Even, and I, but I know how much work that was. And I know how hard it is, you know, and, and how do we, how do we do that and figure that out and decide if it is or it isn't. And we've all been through the, and I don't know, COVID has changed everything in some ways. So, you know, we're trying, so some ways we're just reevaluating everything, which is good. It gives us this way to reevaluate things that we that we might have just said, oh, let's just keep having it like that. Let's just keep doing it that way. Let's just keep doing it that way, right? Yeah. But yeah. we always do it that way. And churches, again, you said it, Kate, and others have said it too. That is just, that's kind of, and I, I don't, again, because my experience is so limited in terms of what other organizations 
that I belong, you know, to which I belong, then I can't really say. Maybe all organizations work that way. Maybe if I was on a bank board and bank boards get together and they say, you know, we've always done it this way. This is the way we're going to do it. You know, I don't know. I think it's kind of human nature to sort of, where's, where's the road and how do I stay on it? And, and if it ain't broke, don't you fix it. it. <laughs> you know, and once you've played, once you've played, once you've gone bowling where they have the rails up, I'm never taking those rails down. <laughs> I'm just telling you because I am an excellent bowler. You are <laughs> with the roll, with the rails up, <laughs> the rails down. Uh, you know what? I, the ball could go in another lane. I could get zeros. I mean, that's the best example I have of that. Like you know, well, I, think I think we I'll, like I'll, to play. We like to bowl when the when the when the sides are up. What yeah. sides? Oh, I guess I haven't been bowling in a while. Children's rails. They, they put, put for babies to use. Do you know where the gutters are? So where they the gutters the are, this, these rails pop up, and then you never get a gutter ball. So little people can have birthday parties and go bowling. Mm -hmm. How cute is that? Well, well that's what cute. I mean. It's cute. I never knew that. I didn't either. Oh, well, I'm six. sorry. Well, about that I'm analogy didn't work. Well, it worked with me. I got it. Well, I will tell you one thing. Oh, there's one in Franklin, and there's one in Brevard. Yeah. There's know, one in Silver. New, new place over at uh, part of Old Edwards. It's, uh, what did Glen you just Cove, say? Glen yeah. Cove, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, their clubhouse there. It's a very family oriented place. Both did a good golf course and the planning for it. But in their clubhouse, in the bottom of it, they got a bowling for, for all the kids. Yes. Wonder, if it has, wonder if it has rails. I didn't. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking that it may have rails that pop up, but I'm thinking that that's not all. Not the only one. Yeah. Well, I was thinking when we did vacation Bibles. Yeah. To me, is an example of all of this kind of thing. We were. Oh, we haven't done it in years. We haven't done it in years. We don't have any children here, so why should we do it? Because we don't have. Well, maybe we'll do it, and then and then it was like you know basically because we don't have any children here we don't have any young mothers here so who was doing it but all the old rods and so <laughs> you know we're and all Todd. and Todd and, so and Todd. Joe Goldstein yes that's and right Joe. and um you know here we are but then we <laughs> it's so much fun yes and yes. and if we only had a few kids. I think we impacted them, but we impacted each other. Yes. I'm going to say from everything I've heard, <laughs> I don't know how the kids did. But like you guys have. Oh, no, but when I but saw your... Everybody that was involved in it, like you and, and others, I think they got a lot out of it. Well, we had the best comment. I mean, when I came out and saw your wife chasing this kid down on her hands and knees down, the I said, what are you doing? Well, he wanted to do it. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I mean, we did, it, and and I think that it was something that can we turn around and do it right away again? Um, I don't know, yeah. but it was wonderful when we and it turned and you were such a, in such a twin of that. How will they know this? How will we do that? And I said, they they don't know what's supposed to be happening. <laughs> so what difference does it that. make? They don't know. So and. It, was hugely successful. That's right. That's right. And it's better that I'd forgotten most of what I knew. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and that we had a bunch of people who, who either hadn't done it, hadn't done it a long time, had done it here. Just, you know, it all worked out that way. That, well, the other way, uh, I just so you, just so you know, for those of you who are not initiates, it's sort of bowling thing. They also have these <laughs> things they blow up that are like extremely large on balloons that just rest in the gutter. So yeah, they, they, serve, those too. they serve the same purpose. <laughs> They're inflatable things that rest in the gutters that keep the ball from going in there. So not necessarily always rails, but it, so, so it doesn't have to re, be refitted. The, well, anyway, is that a lot of information? I don't know what that has to do with anything about, about the profits. Ginger, you all right over there? Yeah, I just got up to open the door, let the cat out the side. All right. <laughs> Who let the cats out? <laughs> All right. Let's move on. If there's no more things uh, that are troubling you, this idea of Hosea uh, called in brokenness. The prophet Hosea. Yes, 10 and 11. Both. Oh. So Hosea, let's see. Who knows something about Hosea? Well, I think that was a tough call God gave him. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, uh, um, Hosea is this, the brokenness, not just of Hosea, but of the, the land of Israel. His own brokenness matched the brokenness of the land, right? He's, this is both a story, um, an allegory, um, um, not, not in the sense that it didn't happen. I don't mean that. I mean in the sense that it really reflects what was going on in the land around him. And, and, and you know, sometimes a lot of the calls to the prophets start off with, who, me? And God goes on to say, yeah, you. And we know the other ones, right? Isaiah says, I am but a boy. Um, uh, Jeremiah said, I am a dresser of sycamore trees, you know, and all, everyone's got a reason why they got, you know, what Moses, I, I you know, I yeah. yeah, you know, there's just things we think we may not be equipped for the call, but I think this chapter shows us in the person of Hosea that indeed God, and I, and I wonder for each of us as well, how often our brokenness, if we can embrace that which is hard, uh, does become a place um, much like Henry Nouwen spoke about in The Wounded Healer. And if one has not read Henry Nouwen's work in that, it is, a good, it is a good way to understand this, that in our brokenness, we have some, we have gained the ability to be with others in their brokenness. And because I'm thinking about the text for this Sunday where the Pharisee and the publican, you know, oh, oh, but for the grace of God, go I. Thank goodness I am not like that tax collector. Well, being a wounded healer means you would be drawn to the tax collector. You would have an affinity for his struggles, for her struggles, for their, for their way of suffering. That would be something that you would and want to engage, right? Not be afraid of or not think you are better than, or it works toward that. I think all of us have a, it is the unusual person, I will say that, who doesn't immediately start to set up a hierarchy wherever they are. Oh, I know more. The wounded healer. Wounded healer. Wounded healer. Yeah. No damn brokenness. Yeah. I might have a copy in my office. And, might. and that's the whole basis of AA. Yes. In any remark. Yeah, any 12 step. Any yeah, yeah. yeah. And what has been so interesting is that they have found the, uh, when they start hearing the measures of success, um, groups, 12 step groups are more effective than psychiatrists mm -hmm. or therapists mm -hmm. in helping people get through those three <laughs> slides and then to true sobriety. Uh, and also not just to sobriety, but uh, moving from being a dry drunk to a feeling person. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you're surrounded in rooms of people who are maybe not exactly the same, mm -hmm but very similar, you know, and, 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 and I've done a lot of codependent work because that's really my addiction. And so um, to sit in rooms of people and hear their stories both frees me up from my shame about it um, and, and allows me to rely on others for support. And, and sometimes the others is God too. And I'm, that's, you know, that's what I like about it most 12 step programs is that God's at the center of that or some higher power. But I think that I was never able to really release my shame, you know, about the way I handled things or what I did or how I encouraged or how I enabled others. And so to be with someone else in a room and hear their stories um, didn't manifest in me. Oh, thank God I didn't do that. Uh, but what it manifested in me was, Oh, I have done some pretty, some, some pretty harmful things to myself and to others and to be able to say that because my tendency is just want to bow up and be like eh, that doesn't matter I've got this <laughs> yeah well I mean certainly I, I you know I get that so here's Hosea 
And um, this, the whole story is, you know, he marries a, a woman whose life was less than stellar. I mean, this is part that makes me uncomfortable sometimes about scripture. He, you know, she was a whore is the way the, this way the Bible is written. Um, and then they have these children and what they're terrible names. And they gave them these awful names. <laughs> you know, you were not loved. You are to be pitied. You are, no one cares, you know, whatever. This, and, but there's a transformation, isn't there? This is what happened. There is healing. There is something that happens that moves them from being this very broken family uh, who, like, I can't help but think about circles in some ways or generational stuff that happens uh, where we just live into the patterns that have been established for us. And then, and how, and how Hosea, with God's help, overcomes this. And, 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 and opens himself up. And if you think about it, it's just, um, it, it, it's just a terrible time in the state of Israel. It's just a terrible time. There's just so many fractures, so many things, so many people attracted to worshiping in a different way. It is very, it's not, and then they have the leader saying, it's okay. We see the benefit of worshiping in this way. So not only have the people are exposed to different ways of being, but the leadership now says, yeah, that's how, we should probably start following these Canaanite gods. And that's one of the reasons why there's so many rules. People, you know, that have all these books where there's so many rules that in Judaism are about what you eat and what you don't eat and all these kind of things was to, to try to guard against Right, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but I mean, uh, yeah, yes, that, but I mean, and then also, you know, like, like, if you start to stray, here's what's might going to happen yeah. to y'all, uh, you know, and that's not what we were called to do. But Hosea's call is like this idea that God may call us in our brokenness or when we do not think we are ready. Now, I don't know how we hold that with what we just heard about relinquishing a ministry, <laughs> but yeah. but we do. That God may call us to things that we may not know we are ready to do. I hear that. I feel that way about ELL. I feel like I don't know enough. I don't know how to fix it. It's not like that it's broken. I think the system is broken. The, 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 the way for people to learn and function in our society is broken. In some ways, that's broken. And we can mm -hmm. fix it in a little way by feeding meals and offering child care and hopefully learning a little bit of English in the meantime. Because it's you know, it's not, it's not a college level course, you know, and, uh, and they still have all the other struggles that they have yeah. just to be here, yeah. but their children are delightful. <laughs> so that's the good news there. Anyway, and then that God well, so while our life is in turmoil and who among us wouldn't say our life at points is in turmoil about something about our children, about our community, about, about our grandchildren right? Our life is in turmoil. And sometimes that feels unfair. Like, can you just not wait, God? Can we, can we not just resolve this issue? And then I'll move serially into my next issue. Because <laughs> it doesn't, but it doesn't normally work that way. You know, we have to be responsible for kind of for setting some boundaries. I get all that too. There's that. And I do encourage people to try to set their own boundaries as well. Well, you know, I think for me, um, I think God can prepare us in increments of when he knows we're going to be ready. That doesn't mean, you know, that there's not uh, a calling or somebody placed in our life that, that gives us that, you know, little, little nudge of, mm -hmm, there you go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for me, that happened over a period of like, 14 years, uh, you know, after uh, the birth of our second daughter, who has lots of, of challenges and, and disabilities. Um, and, you know, the first time, you know, and Allison's heard the story, uh, the first time that God spoke to me um, was through the lady in the yarn shop in Dayton, Ohio, who said, 
have you thought of going in? Because I was a stay-at-home mother at that point. Have you thought of going into special ed? I looked at her like, are you crazy? You know, I've got a, a, a one-year-old. I'm doing therapy one eight hours a day and a three-year-old. and We're military. And how's that going to happen? How's that going to work? You know, and then like six, seven years later, you know, it was one of my former elementary school students from Altus, Oklahoma, and we're living in San Antonio and he's getting married. And I had kept up with his mother who I talked with. And, and uh, so I went to the wedding and, and Brad said the day before, anyway, and Brad said, Mrs. Duncan, have you thought of going into special ed? And I'm like, what? No. <laughs> he must have talked to that other lady. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> states away and said, I said, no, I'm still at home. I'm still you know, doing therapy eight hours a day. No. You know. And, you know, I just, I just couldn't see it. And, you know, then there were several years later and we're in Montgomery, Alabama. And, you know, this job opens up at school hours. That's all I cared about because Lindsay was finally in school. And it was school hours. I didn't care what it was. You know, it's like, I'll take it. It's school out. And it was a special school because it was Alabama people. You know, I don't care if it was 1980, you know, five. Um, <laughs> but it was Alabama. And the school was like, you know, hidden out in the woods, you know, uh, way out of there. And I took the job because it was school out, you know. And my neighbor who was a PT said, hey, there's an opening at this school. I said, hey, sounds good to me. Go be an aide, please. And the teacher that I worked under, who was like 27 and I was like 39, you know, looked at me and said, Have you thought of going? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was it. I just thought, okay, you know, it's the old three times. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it, it it turned out to be a long process. Um, but I needed that length of time, I think, to prepare my heart, my soul, not that I was healed, um, you know, of the pain of going, you know, through that whole experience. Um, but I needed to be at that before I can mm-hmm. answer that that call. And then, you know, he sent us to Lubbock, Texas, where there's, you know, a, a university, you know, and we were there long mm-hmm. enough and more for me to finish my degree. I mean, I look back on that. And, you know, one of the reasons I love telling it is because it's just amazing, isn't it? (laughs) Well, you just think, what is the purpose here? And and then in my career, which was not as long as it could be because I was old by the time I started, um, I could connect with those parents Mm -hmm. at a level that other, Mm -hmm. you know, other people couldn't. They were great people. I've talked with great people. Um, and they had a great heart for the kids. Um, but I and I could tell them some of the horrible things, you know, that I thought and sometimes did. Um, and you know, I think it 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 maybe served a purpose in their life. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it just many times. Well, they would never have had that perspective. Yeah, and from a it, parent of a of a special needs child, right? And it it is just amazing to see that you know it may not be next year or next week or ten years from now, you know, but um, the purpose is revealed to you. Mm-hmm. And so, thanks for heeding the call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is persistent. And, and I will tell you this because I'm not going to be here again. Yes, it's my one shot, y'all. Yes. Um, I have really. Gosh, str- I never, never known we've been now. gotten rid of somebody as quickly as that. Yeah. She has other obligations yeah, on Thursday, Thursday. Thursday is my day to go to the bar to take Lindsay shopping into the bank and, and, and do the things that we get. It. But um, I'm leaving after this to go because it's anyway. Um, so, so since I retired, um, which was in 2009, you know, and I volunteered at the schools because that was, you know, a natural progression. I mean, I love that. I love that. But lately, since COVID, because, you know, then I had been quit that, I just felt un, unanchored. I, I just felt an unease, like, well, you know, I'm 75. I don't think the game's over yet, but could be. Um, and I just didn't know. 
And this is one reason I bought this book, even though I knew I couldn't come. I thought, I think I need this book. It's a great book. And this is what I, I feel really strongly, people, and I'm not a person that goes up the old I think that God is calling me to work with, are you ready? An elder. It's mm -hmm. like, well, hello, what group are you in? <laughs> the really ill. Elder. 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 Yeah, yeah, the really elder. 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 I was going to say, wait a minute. Well, don't look at this group. No, no, no. We're not and so, No, and that's what you're saying. You know, you know. And so um, this week, um, I felt so strongly, even though we're not through the book, I called um, uh, Chestnut Hill, Hill mm -hmm. and spoke to Felicia. The, the the social activities director and so we're meeting monday and i don't know where this will be but i'm so excited Good. part of it is because i have an older sister in jacksonville who's in an independent living situation there and part of it i think but mainly it's i just feel god come mm -hmm. i have a middle sister who's recently been diagnosed with dementia mm -hmm. it's not you know like you know, the, the end kind of, you know, but there, it's definite. I don't get it. Um, and so I kind of feel like it's the old, if you can't love the ones, you know, you love, love the ones you're with, which I'm not sure if that's all meant that. Because it's been a long time. So I <laughs> I was just thinking, boy, when I knew that song, that song was okay, so that yeah. is not what it meant. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You can reinterpret it. Yeah, that's what it means that to you. I think that's what, and, and having been a military family, um, you know, I think that's what it always meant to me, which I was not that cool growing up even. And, you know, I just thought, well, you know, I'm going to love these people in whatever way I can mm -hmm. and um, you know, not to say I don't love my sisters but there are hundreds and hundreds right. of them. maybe a Nancy in their town exactly exactly yes wonderful that's enough of me okay. well in your you know and it's not necessarily you know we, we use that word brokenness and somebody can think well I don't know I haven't been I'm not that damaged or whatever but it could be just a space in our lives where we have where we have known that we are not in control. Mm -hmm. I, you know, sometimes we can interpret brokenness that way when we're finally able to see that there's not everything that I can fix. Right. You know. Um, it, however, you know, uh, Bishop Wright's third thing here. You know, don't wait until you're ready. That's his his third one about this call out of brokenness. But we don't know what what does that mean when you're ready. Right. It could just be you had not, perhaps if you'd have been somewhere else, not Lubbock, right? right. Or there wasn't a school, you'd say, well, I'm not ready. And you wouldn't, but so maybe you weren't completely ready, but there were other circumstances that allowed you to continue with that call. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and his are just examples anyway. They're just examples about how, um, how to fill in the spaces, the blank spots when we say what, you know, I don't, I don't feel qualified or I'm to this, this thing that has happened to me now, you know, like if somebody, I did used to work for a guy who'd said, well, you know, when someone like a widow comes to you, you should just get her in involved in a ministry. And I was like, what? And he said, oh, no, just the best thing to do is just get right in there and get to work. And I thought, well, I'm glad that's worked for you, but I would never do that. That is just not, but I might think about where other opportunities might be, but I would never just slot someone. So they have work to do. Um, and, I, and maybe he didn't mean it that way, and I already didn't like him, so I was, I was probably I was probably just, just looking giving for, all the things that are wrong. All the things that oh, are wrong. Right there. All the, the things need help in greater practice. Well, I'm ah! going to go yeah. I find I'm somebody going to I'm Chestnut sure. Hill. Dump me on the floor. <laughs> That's always true. all one right. Person. Just one person. That's right. Oh, how okay? How so? We've we've heard one example of God using brokenness as a way of enabling us to be a blessing to others. Um, and then you could also think of it as another way, which as how has how have other people's brokenness ministered to you? I love that uh, question because. I think when I met people whose lives were full, meaning they didn't just get out of college, go to seminary, become a priest, 
that looked like a perfect life, when I met others who'd had a full life, done things, said things, been places, had regrets, had, you know, and that I could say that, oh, there's, I see myself there. There's a place for me. I'm not, I don't, you know, it doesn't have to look like a certain pattern um, that I would, that, I'm, that for my own expectations. So other people's brokenness, um, mostly for me, it was a woman priest who, you know, been married and divorced and was in her late forties when she went to seminary. So that's not exactly age isn't necessarily brokenness, but it did show me some ways that I might still be able to live out a call that I thought, I, that I thought God was, I thought I heard. Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure. For me, um, it was a group that I did at uh, Fenwick Hall at the treatment facility. Um, Having known the background by sitting in the report um, of so many of the people, you know, it was a room full of folks, and I was talking about the importance of of living in the steps, not doing the steps, Mm -hmm. being the steps. Um, But I always started, I looked around, I'd look around that room. And, you know, I said, I, you forgive me, but I, every time I start this lecture, I have chills because I, I know where, I know where all of you have been. I know the number of times you wrecked your cars, the number of times you lost jobs, mm-hmm. the families that have turned their back on you, the adult children that you have that aren't speaking to you, um, the suicide attempts you made, you shouldn't even be alive. But for whatever reason, you are in here this minute and given another chance. And just, it, it gave me chills every time. Well, I always wanted to be a school teacher. <laughs> I wanted to teach political science to middle school kids for very selfish reasons, but that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and wow. Wow. <laughs> Not like that you did, but to political science to middle school would be so difficult, I would think. Oh, that's, I don't know. I love middle different. school kids and I and Absolutely. the others my bad was a passion and that's what I wanted to do. But my family said that's not what I should do. So we had plenty of lawyers and teachers in our family and we didn't meet anymore. So I did what they wanted me to do. Um and which was to become a fashion merchandiser, um, oh, buyer, that. that kind of thing, and which inspired you to break a back. <laughs> inspired me to break a back right there. Uh, and it's like when my mother have a my mother said, Well, you have a degree in marketing, and now you've got this thing, the EFM degree. What are you gonna do? I said, I guess I'm gonna market religion. I'm not sure, mother, exactly what I'm gonna do, but. I never did. I mean, I, you know, I had a couple of different marketing jobs and things, but then when I moved, we moved to New Orleans and this church and the priest there, well, he was a curate, wanted to start this thing called the EFM. It was a newer idea. Bill what? EFM. Oh, oh, okay. And, Education for mm-hmm. yeah. and so, yeah. It is good. And I, so I've said, well, I, he had to have six people. And I said, well, I, I might like to do that. And this man in the church, who was a brand new church, said, oh, no, it's a four-year obligation. I don't know that you really, you know, have the, have the background and religion and that kind of stuff. I looked at this man and I said, put my name on that line. <laughs> and so God knew what it took to get you involved. Yeah. So, well, knew it took well, but the to thing, well, well, but the thing was, I wanted to do it. I didn't even know what it was. And I mean, but I knew that in my life, I'd always had this conflict. Well, not a conflict. I'd always had these two religions in my life and neither side could quite understand how I could embrace the other. And most people still can't, but that's okay. Um, But what it let me do was then become a mentor of EFM with multi-level groups and all over 
the place. And so I did get to teach. And they weren't middle school teachers, the children. But the Episcopal Church is not really great on educating biblically their children and the people in the church and all this kind of stuff. And some of the stories I can tell you, but the questions that were asked of me would just knock you out of your chair. But it that was it. You know, I mean, I did. I did get to teach. I did get to see people go, oh, you know, and mm -hmm. learn and have all hominids and stuff like that. And it's added all of this to my life because I don't know that I would ever, you know, it made me so interested in all of this mm -hmm. that um, sometimes you just have to wait for somebody to say, I don't think you can really do that. <laughs> Well, we haven't seen that call as one of the calls listed yet. He hasn't written about the call in defiance to someone else. <laughs> Perhaps that's yet to come. I was somewhat indignant about the yes, fact I, that I... The call of, the, the call of uh, insulting. Yes, that's right. <laughs> well, I mean, seriously. Yeah, well, we'll see. Next week, we are going to talk with we'll talk about Amos, another oh, one of the Amos. prophets. And this is God's intrusive call. I think next week we have two chapters, so... It's 12 and 13, and it's uh, Amos and Isaiah. So, um, oh, say Amos and <laughs> no. that's another call. Um, <laughs> that's a call for redemption. Um, called in holiness and called in call in intrusive. God's intrusive call. Wow. So, Did you say kids get to change their names like when they were married or anything? Or um, they just had to carry that. They did get, I mean, their names became something different. Their names became something. They, not that yeah. their names changed. But they dropped, it didn't it just drop the one piece of it. I'm trying to remember now. It, it, I did give you the text in here. So at the end of, it's like five pages here. So at the end, Right, right, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and there's that, they turned a song into a hymn. He changed the oil of the sadness into the oil, oil of gladness. gladness uh -huh. And um, yeah, God, God finishes what he starts. Right. So um, he's he going to take care of the killing. He will. <laughs> Because he says, so in verse 23, I will sow him for myself in the land and I will have pity on the Ruhama, not pitied. And I will say to the Ami, not my people, you are my people. Yeah. And yeah. you shall say, yeah. you are my people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks be to God. Yes. <laughs> Yes. For another great lesson. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Yes. And thank you to Bishop Little and uh, oh, for his work. Good There's so many good nuggets. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it makes it fun to read. And it's short enough. And I like That's his own. I like. I like his own. Um, the, his stories mm -hmm. are disclosive in, 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 in that way that I think encourages us to be. Yes. You know, I so identified. So in the last chapter, when he said, you know, in a funeral, when you don't know what you're saying, but you look out and this happens every funeral. And so it's a common, I, I so related to it when I look out and I look for the one person who's nodding, smiling, sometimes crying, you know, that I make a connection with yeah. because I don't, you don't normally know, but eight people yeah. and sometimes exactly. in a parish funeral, you might know a few more, but you know, and then having that one, one sort of way to respond to you, you know, that what you're doing is important care you know you know mm -hmm. it's, it, that it means something to others and that it is god's word that you're trying to push because sometimes it does seem like oh, who you know who cares yeah. i mean it just does it just does especially when you don't know people very well or yeah and you know people are coming from thousand different backgrounds yeah. thousand different backgrounds because you know because when they you know you say the lord be with you and everybody just looks at you <laughs> and, and you find yourself doing all the responses as well as the, you know the invitations to prayer it happens in weddings too, but somehow the, the focus is so different, it doesn't really matter. Sure. Well, Ginger, you popped.